After, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Desmond Artis, and uh, what you're looking at right now is a uh, collage done by uh, a man named Romero Bearden, and it's called the uh, Calabash. And I'm uh, presenting this to you because um, this is what uh, mostly what my thesis is about is about using collage um, as a means for architectural design, and uh, some of the terms you'll see. Uh, that I'm going to talk about terms such as uh, recontextualization, uh, super imposition um, with the layering um, are seen in this collage and in others that I will show you. So just hold on. There's an arrow above. Arrow above. There we go. Okay. All right, here is a general layout <coughs> of my of my thesis diagram, um, and right, and you have my research in the middle with my application, and underneath is uh, the technical information as far as my building site um, and uh, my building program and things of that nature. But uh, we will go ahead and get into it. Um, as I said before, uh, it's a scoring collage as a process for creating architectural design. And uh, this is what I'm planning to do in my thesis. Um, I'm planning to learn um, about the collage principles and extract them and use them in my architectural design. Uh, these principles will be defined, and you'll also see them in the collage artist works. Uh, these collage works will also serve as a precedent um, in my studies. And then, as I study these, I will make uh, some personal 2D explorations of collage uh, to further engage collage. And then those will become, then I'll take those and use those to make 3D conceptual models. <clears throat> and with those conceptual models, um, I'll then engage them in my site as far as building program to see which one works in order to come to a final design. All right, and again, here's my uh, thesis diagram. We're about to uh, Go into the research area. Let's see. All right. And uh, so far, um, in studying collage, I've come across uh, four principles, which is uh, fragmentation, uh, recontextualization, appropri appropriation, and uh, superimposition. <clears throat> um, in fragmentation, uh, collage artists uh, such as uh, the early ones, uh, Pablo Picasso, uh, George Bach, uh, Juan Gris, they were they were interested in um, breaking up the uh, picture the picture plane on a two D canvas. So they so in all their paintings that was their that was their main emphasis to break up this to break up this plane, and it went against the uh, traditional view of having a foreground. A middle ground and a background of a painting, but they say we're just gonna we're just gonna break that up and play with it. And also in fragmentation um, and collage arts, you'll see that <clears throat> the pieces themselves that they use are uh, fragmented as well. The fragments of holes used in the whole collage and uh, recontextualization with um, and the Dada's the Dada's movement used this in their photo montages. What they would do. Is they would uh, place place people or things in areas where um, you wouldn't see them. Like for example, in uh, there's one class by Max Ernst where there's uh, an example of a, a beetle and it's turned upside down and it's used as um, a flagship in uh, in this in this collage. <clears throat> All right, appropriate appropriation is about um, when they use materials, not really, not really the conventional materials used in art, but um, different materials. Like there was uh, the artist Kurt Schwitters. Um, he was known for just walking around the city and picking up random 
um, thing, uh, materials, uh, pe which people consider trash or things of that nature, and he would use them in his art pieces. And then uh, super superimposition, forgive me for my uh, definition, <laughs> um, but it's more so about there, putting, putting things on top of uh, each other, and it's mostly used for hiding and suppressing what's there, or also revealing what's there. Now to the media. These are uh, my precedents uh, right now, and I have precedents by the collage artists, and I have precedents by the architects. <coughs> and these are uh, Pablo Picasso and George Brock. Uh, this one was a uh, uh, chair with uh, Canning, still life of chair with Canning. This is done by Pablo Picasso, and the other one. That's done by George Brock. This is uh, this is a I'm sorry. Homage to J. S. Bach. Yeah, that was one of his favorite um, composers. Moving on, yeah, Bela Zisky and uh, Kurt Switters. And the uh, first image is called Crown 19B. Um, right here, and the second image. Um, by Kurt Switters. It's called MZ443. He uh, came up, Kurt Switters, he came up with something called the MERS pictures. And uh, MERS was supposed to be, be a play on the word commerce. Um, and here you have Romare Bearden and David Hockney, um, who mostly use photographs. Romare Bearden, he, he took clippings of newspaper, I mean, magazine photographs, and used them in his uh, collages. And David Hockney, he used um, pictures uh, that he personally took and put them together to um, to make his collages. Um, as you see right here, um, the body is being fragmented by the various uh, different pieces of material, and also you have quilts uh, quilting going on in this collage. And with David Hockney, um, when he first started out. Um, he started out with these things called joiners, which are Polaroids he had taken. And he was trying to show um, time and a whole photograph. Because with photography, most of the time, the instance is called, caught, caught in 1 60th of a second, 1 100th, and so on. Um, he wanted to show diverse intervals of time and um, diverse intervals of perspective also. And then here's his most famous one. Uh, this was called Pure Blossom Highway 2. Um, when he moved on to 4 by 6, I mean 35 millimeter. And these, um, he said he took almost about a thousand, there's about a thousand 4 by 6s um, that he used to make up that whole composition right there. Um, now I move on to the architects who used, um, in, this, in this area, what I'm looking for as far as precedence, I'm looking for. Architects who have used photo montage or collage in the process. Um, also looking, I'm also looking at architects who have uh, created buildings um, with the principles of collage that I've discussed discussed before, either directly or indirectly. And uh, right here we have uh, Mies van der Rohe, and uh, he has uh, these are photo montage studies for a concert hall. And he has another um, photo montage study for a provincial hall project. Like all this right here is a photo montage, as well as this um, American flag. And what he was doing, he was um, studying space. <coughs> Next up is the uh, group Archigram. And what they did was uh, they were, they, were, they didn't like the uh, provincial memes that people were producing architecture in Britain, so they kind of uh, rebelled and started uh, doing their own thing. It was a group of, I think about 11 architects in total, or maybe six. I'll, I'll, get, it, um, I'll get that straight away. Um, next is uh, Cabousier, and this is, um, this is a building he built in uh, Cara Curitia. It's in um, Argentina. And it said that he used uh, collage in his, in his paintings. And this is a direct result of 
is uh, glass. This um, building is said to have uh, great examples of how space is used, which he said he got from the space uh, dimensions and depths in this collage. Um, next up is Daniel uh, Beeskin. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And right here is oh shoot. It's a, it is an add-on to a museum. And here are his photo, uh, collages that he used in production of his building. Right there. Um, let's see. And also uh, Frank Gehry in his early houses. Um, one is uh, the Winston Guest House, and the other one is, um, sorry, I forgot the name of it. But here, what I'm looking at with this house in particular is the pieces of the house, the residential house, are kind of set apart from each other, unlike a modern day house where basically the, the bedrooms, the living room, the dining room, and the family room are all together. And here, Frank Gehry uh, broke them apart, which would be an example of uh, fragmentation. And also, with here, looking at the uh, different materials he's using to compose this uh, residential um, dwelling area. Okay, for my um, application, as I said before, um, I wanted to, oh, I'm sorry, I want to get into my art explorations and to help me um, explore these, um, explore this collage. Um, I took, I'm taking a class right now um, offered by Loma and it gives you, um, and it's a self-guided class in collage and the lady's guiding me, um, guiding her students through making collages like uh, Pablo Picasso, George Brock, like Kurt Schwitters, like the greats, and they're showing contemporary collage as well. And uh, as I said before, I would like to take those collages and those 2D collages and make 3D conceptual models out of them. And the reason I have two rows here because um, I'm thinking I can make two uh, for each collage that I do. I can make two or probably more so models for each collage. And the reason I'm doing it this way um, is because my art explorations are being informed by all the knowledge and all the information I've studied for um, with collage. So, which will inform my collages and my 3D concept models, which will then be, which will, I will then look at to see which one is best for an investigation into coming into my final design. Um, for my building type program, it's, um, I want to, um, I want to choose a site here in Tallahassee, um, probably on the southern side. And right now, I'm thinking about a residential house or a dwelling unit or a youth center. I'm sorry that comes up, that's up there twice. Um, but no, I'm sorry. And then um, looking at building type precedents for that, and then uh, going through the program, choosing the site, and those two will be coming together for my final design. And that's it. Well, I have uh, several comments. Sure. I don't know if you want to hear from me first, but I'll stop start. Um, a, a lot of your, I find that, that the fact that you can see the whole thing at once very useful. I think that perhaps everybody can see the benefit of being able to see the kind of the whole process at once and how you go in and out and how they all start to connect. I think it still needs to be finessed, but I, I think this is a good start. <coughs> I think a lot of your things you said, you were telling us what the artist did. Mm -hmm. You were telling us what the architect did, but I wanted to know why. Why? Uh, you don't have to, I'm just okay. saying. You okay. just need to dig a little deeper and tell us why. So, for instance, why why did the Cubist artists delve into fragmentation? What was happening at the time in history? What was happening in science? What was happening, you know, what was influencing some of the, those kinds of moves? And you can find them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. you can yeah. find them in each one of the, the examples that you gave. And then the other thing that's lacking is you need to compare and contrast. Okay. 
not only within the group of artists, but the artists and the architects. And I think it would be good, I think especially when you get to this section where you talk about the architects, to maybe talk a little about, about your sources, because I think it's probably new, mm -hmm. new information to most of us. Right, okay. And, um, let's see. If you could zoom in to go up to the second square from the left, big square. Right here. Yeah, right in there. Zoom into that. Mm -hmm. I think you can prop you can think about reorganizing some of that. Uh, you know, when you talk about the artists, you didn't tell us what term. You did oh, yeah, in some cases, but I don't see it. Right. All right, so those words should be in there. The fragmentation, the right. contextualization. Right. right. Um, could you go zoom in, zoom in even closer to the precedence by architects? Sure. Or, excuse me, by artists. Um, yeah, I just want to know more about them. Okay. And, and then go shift over to the right. More about the artists in particular, or more about the artwork that they the did. artwork and why and 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 a comparison and contrasting of that those group of artists one to the other. How do they differ? How are they the same? Okay. And then shift shift over to you want to say something? Yeah. Um, just having the name of the buildings because I noted that. When you're presenting, most of the time you didn't know the name of the building or where it's from. So, if you had it up there, instead of you trying to figure out what it was, it would have been there. Okay. And then when you get to this section, to me it seems like it's architects who use collage as process, mm -hmm. and then architects whose artifact or actual design reflects collage. Right. I didn't. Um with this side, because that's that's what I have so far as far as collage. I have I have artists. I know I have architects who um, use collage representationally, mm -hmm. and then I have architects who use collage um, in building artifacts. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm saying is, you need to be clear about that. I'm not clear. saying there's anything wrong with that. Oh, just clear. But you need to be more distinct about that. I was. Um, I was thinking about when I was putting this together, um, it was last minute thought, and I was uh, trying to get it together. I'm thinking that with this whole thing, um, I could put in a chart with, and I think that would help out with the comparison and contrast and the artists um, and the architects along with the principles I was still with collage. Good. I'm, I'm, and, charts are okay. And the organization. There are other ways of showing it too. We can discuss that later on. Okay. Then it starts to get a little bit muddier when you get go to the application, and you talk about how you're using the uh, the collage in your process. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm I mean, not sure about the the part right above the word architectural explorations. The two rows of. Yes. Yeah. What. It seems like you're not talking about where does the actual uh, site, the program, how does how does that? How does I don't that think mean? you can separate. I don't think you can just do a collage and say, yeah, I'm going to take this collage and it's going to be placed on the site. I think there has to they have to inform one another, and I don't think that's really reflected yet in how you presented the process. So you're saying this. This uh, site building type building program should probably be closer and be like an underlying. Term. Well, I'm not really. You know, yeah, we are talking about where things are on the chart, but I'm just talking about your approach to actually getting to the design application. Okay. I think we need to, we need to think about that. Some marriage, more. so marry the two. Perhaps. Perhaps. We need okay. to talk about that some more. And then I'm not, I'm not that sold on the building type. Okay. As you really need to think about the building type. Mm -hmm. And what kind of building type and site is going to lend itself to you using collage? Right. Cool. 
kind of like some uh, some comments. Mm -hmm. I continue to be uh, fascinated by the, by the topic and the exploration. Uh, what I'm going to say to you really applies to all these guys. Something that I that I think all of you it would be good for you to think about is okay. You're interested in collage. You're interested in collage as a design tool. Um, why? What's your hunch? Why does that intrigue you? And and to me, it comes down to for almost all of you is none of you really doing are doing a real scientific uh, thesis where you're saying I'll bet that and you're putting out a proposition and you're testing it. All of your theses are more like I wonder what would happen if. And you're saying, I wonder what would happen if I use collage to design with. So if, if that's the prelude to this whole thing, then I think it's important as you proceed through it, and especially when you're done, that you reflect on what was it like to do it. Did you have to compromise some programmatic configurations? In other words, I think you're exploring something. You're not just saying, that's an interesting pool over there. I think I'll jump in. You've got a you've got a kind of a purpose about your navigation here, and, and I think that the way you proceed, and especially the way you reflect when you're done, wants to convey to us whatever that wisdom is that you learn. So if the first sentence is "I wonder what would happen if," at the end it's "Here's what happened when." You know what I mean? So that you're you're giving us some wisdom. You're not just saying, "Hey, I swam in the pool a little while." And we go, oh, "Okay, great. <laughs> I bet you enjoyed it." There's got to be some extraction and some winnowing and some some lesson teasing out here. That's the part of it that I'm interested in. Um, I'm curious what the subjects of your art explorations will be. Um, oh, I should have. Uh, what will what will what will start you thinking about those collages? Or, or are those the project-related ones? Those are the um, those are the project-related ones. Like uh, also in, in the class I mentioned that I'm using to help me uh, go throughout it, um, the lady the lady says, "All right, here's here's Picasso and Brock. Um, they use this. They analyze two paintings, one from." each artist and one from a contemporary artist who's using the same type of thoughts and ideas. Then at the end they say, okay, we're in the studio now. It's your turn to try to fill this out, this uh, fragmentation, this recontextualization. It's your time to uh, fill this out and do this uh, exploration. So it kind of it kind of goes along um, kind of goes along with the class. Okay, so those yeah. are the class-driven yeah. ones, class and they are your immersion in what it's like to work with collage, right? But not architectural yet. Not architectural. You're just learning the medium. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and then you're gonna, then you're gonna eventually turn this toward the project. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm way. not clear because it seems like it's not clear that they're separate. At least not from what I heard you say. Okay. And I'm not sure they should be separate. And furthermore, I want to say that this, to me, is like what professors do when they create a design studio project. Mm -hmm. They have to, to figure out what the parameters are, what is the goal. I think you need to carefully design it. Okay. It, it, of, it. It of itself is a design project and design it in such a way to maximize what you get out of it. Right. Okay, I see what you're saying because if I, if I do the class, if I do the class explorations, and let's say I focus on, um, like we were uh, talking about yesterday, that we if we focus on one of the um, principles, mm -hmm. fragmentation. So for this collage, I'm going to focus in on fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So now I have a collage of fragmentation, and then on the next one, I'll have a collage of fragmentation. So therefore, I'm doing I'm doing exploration classwork and um, coming to grasp with collage. Mm -hmm. And I'm also handling taking care um, exploring one of the principles that I pulled from studying collage. There may be another dimension of value too in the identification of those four principles in fragmentation. 
on one level, your exploration of collage as artifact and as, let's say, uh, inspiration for design, that's one route. The other route, or another route, is to take those concepts by themselves. You, you've mined them, you've harvested them from collage, from the world of collage. Now fragmentation can sit on its own, appropriation can sit on its own. And just taking those principles and applying them to the project, which is not applying collage, it's applying wisdoms extracted from collage to design. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. That might give you another realm of value, let's say, or usefulness to having immersed yourself in collage. Mm -hmm. One's the artistic, configurational, inspirational art one, and the other one is abstract concept. What does fragmentation mean in an architectural project? What does appropriation mean? What does recontextualization mean? Or forget collage, what does that mean? What does that really mean exactly? Yeah, I think that there needs to be a, it's like you talked about the, there being a reflection at the end. Mm -hmm. Perhaps there's reflection after you do the your art pieces. Okay. The part where you reflect on them, and that informs the next thing that you do. Uh, okay. That's what you're saying. Doing doing the art pieces not necessarily not necessarily for those four principles. No, or? I'm saying you're doing it, but but have give yourself a chunk of time where you reflect on them before you immerse yourself into the. And then take those. Next thing. And yeah. then take those. As Professor Weiss said, yeah. what's fragmentation? What did you like learn from it? And, and then about. where do you think you might, you know, because at each stage it could be, this is what I wanted to do, this is what happened, this is what I learned from it, and from that this is what I think I want to do. So you keep cycling through those things as you go. Okay. Cool. Maybe a little too much. Thanks. Okay, my name is Jerome Dillon, and uh, the name of my project is the Brown Center for Sustainable Living and the Generator for Sustainable Architecture. Yeah. 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 Is that what it is? Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 Thesis proxy diagram. Uh, we're going to begin with ideology, then we're going to environmentalism, sustainability, and the product called hemp. Then we're going to go into the three components of hemp, which is fiber, herb, and seed. And then we're going to go ahead and look at the, the, the indirect. We're going to examine this indirect and technical approach um, and then transform it to the architectural artifact. Right now, we're going to look at explore, and explore ideology. Ideology is a system of thought that can move um, individuals, social movements, or institutions. I'll give you examples of ideologies, uh, some of them of which is influence architecture. Uh, for example, uh, Nazism influenced architecture. They wanted to capture the monumentality of Rome in the architecture without embellishment and to move, to move the masses, which they've done successfully. Um, but the the ideology that I chose to explore was environmentalism. The reason why I chose environmentalism is as compared to uh, Nazism, which was a political ideology to move the masses, environmentalism is more of a social movement of people who went to manipulate government, not manipulate government, but, but move government to act in its accord. 
So environmentalism is the advocacy, the preservation and improvement of the natural environment, especially in the social and political move to control environmental pollution. And as we see in this slide, we see people, masses of people who are concerned about the environment, which influenced the development of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. And the movement to, and to, to prepare and take care of the environment took place in the 1960s and 1970s, even to this day. So we move into the era of sustainability. And sustainability is, excuse me, it's about <coughs> taking care of our resources such that they're not permanently depleted or damaged. Um, because of this, uh, in 1987, the Brundtland Commission developed this book called Our Common Future, in which they, they, they developed the term for sustainable development by means of meeting the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Because right now, they're on our current path, we cannot maintain it. Um, so they want to bring the people, planning and crop together so that it's variable, equitable, and viable. So that it can be sustainable. And then, um, uh, we also take note of, of Edward Nasrud, who took note of the dangers of forth in the environment. Uh, he noted that 47.6% uh, of all energy produced in the United States is uh, taken by the building industry. Um, his goal for Architecture 2030 is to have all buildings by 2030 to be carbon neutral, all new buildings and renovated buildings to be carbon neutral by the year 2030. And I'm proposing hemp as one of those products that can be used to achieve that goal. So we move into product for hemp. <coughs> hemp is divided into three components, uh, fiber, herb, and seam. There is a fourth component, which is resin, and that's for medicinal purposes. And these are the benefits of hemp. Uh, they're fire resistant, it has a negative carbon footprint, um, it's uh, recyclable, biodegradable, it's durable. Um, there's excellent thermal insulation, and there's carbon dioxide sequestration, which means that even if it's in the, within the built structure, it will still continue to take in carbon dioxide and trap it within the system and release itself after uh, biodegradation. And with biodegradation. So we're going to look at the direct and technical approach of the hemp. Now, what can be produced from hemp are hemp blocks, uh, hemp, concrete, hemp concrete blocks that can be used for wall systems and build structures. Hemp, hemp creek can also be sprayed on, or it can be a hemp line or hemp with, with hemp creek and fill in between, as seen in your stream and right. You can have the hemp line block system with the hemp creek infill, or you can have spray on hemp creek, or you can have hemp creek with a lime ring. For insulation purposes, right now we have insulation that are used, but some of them could be toxic. You have to wear certain uniforms in order to go put it in. But if you use hemp fiber insulation, layered hemp insulation, rigid, rigid hemp insulation, and hemp insulation back, a typical homeowner or business or con contracting company can install these without worrying about any damage to themselves or to the environment. Some of these are some of the precedents that I'm looking at regards to hemp blocks or hemp being used as a building product. Uh, the Wise Center for uh, Alternative Technology, they use it for they use straw bale and hemp for their building. Uh, Lime Technology Office Building use hemp blocks for their building. And French Regional Government Office Building, as you can see over here, they use a timber frame system with hemp blocks as infill. Now we're going to the indirect and poetic aspect of So we look at the, the, um, the weaving aspect of hemp fiber, and uh, what I did is I created a conceptual model based off of that. We looked at the cross section of hemp and uh, how it absorbs the material, or how it absorbs from the earth to make it into a tree. So I created a conceptual model based on absorbing, those absorbing qualities. Um, there's Hemp can also be respiratory, so I looked at that and developed a model based on its respiratory qualities. Hemp could also be flexible. It's been used to make rope and canvas, so I created a model to reflect that. Next, we have the elasticity of hemp. Hemp can be used as, a, as an elastic material, so I created a model, a conceptual model for that process. 
and these are some other models that I've created for, for representing the indirect aspect of him, some of the light, some of the long, uh, the quality of durability, the attribute of it being strong. These are just conceptual models used, uh, that might be used later on for building development. Now we're getting into the architectural artifact. This is the project location. It's 314,000 project for 58 square feet. Um, it's located south of the Design Center of the Americas in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And it's going to be, and since the Design Center of the Americas is used to display uh, objects um, for sale, I wanted the, my building to be there for, to represent a sustainable building that people can view um, and that will also display items that will be sustainable. And finally, this is my program. Uh, the general operations provide information regarding sustainable means of living from homeowners to corporate executives and government officials. The departments that it's going to cover is residential, commercial, educational, industrial, and government. And the spaces that it's going to provide, it's going to show and highlight is material selection, water management, renewable energy, building systems. It's going to be um, environmental lab, video rooms, and outdoor space, outdoor exhibition space. So it's going to be about 30,000 square feet. That concludes my presentation. How many, uh, how many total conceptual poetic models have you made? I've made about, uh, about 11. And what's your total number? Uh, about 33. Why 33? Um, I, I want to create three three aspects of each uh, attribute of hemp, of, or of either hemp fiber, her, and seed, uh, just to create some ideas. And then out of the three, I'll choose which one I can work together to, to come up with a building design. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I, well, as a child of the 70s, I mean, this sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I didn't quite get the Nazism part and the um, comparing that to, to um, environmentalism. It's, it just seems like a big leap. Well, what I wanted to show is that that was a political ideology that, that, that they wanted to use architecture to influence the masses. Right. And they did that and they, and they, they were successful at it as compared to environmentalism, which was really an individual and social movement of the people. And now they're using that movement to influence architecture. I think that might get clearer. I think what she's asking is she's sensing a content relationship, but there isn't one. Yeah. He started out, his first thesis idea was the relationship between ideology and building. And so the Nazism is an example, is an example of an ideology in a building printout. Maybe if you show three ideologies and three building printouts, it'll be clear that you're not trying to show there's a linear thought between Nazism and sustainability. Right. I think that's what she's tripping on. Okay. I'm not tripping. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean tripping psychedelic. Oh. I mean <laughs> getting tangled up on it. Yeah. Um, I, I, do you even need that? And is, it, is that something that you feel strongly about, talking about the isms? Um, I, I think that it's important because somehow, some way, there's some sort of ism that influences architecture. Okay. Um, and by highlighting that, I feel that um, we can successfully create sustainable buildings if we highlight the same works on the environmentalism. Okay. And then I want to hear more about like where, why hemp? Where is it used? Why is it used in the United States? How will it be manufactured? How will it affect the economy? Um, it just seems like there's a lot of different positive things or missing information or content context that would be good to know in your project. Well, how do you that? Right now it's illegal. You can't do it in the States. Aren't there some Places where you, you can, but it's expensive, right? Yes. Yeah, you pay through the nose to use hemp as a sustainable material in the States. The only, um, only, the only state that's producing hemp on an experimental basis is Hawaii, but it's not for sale to produce products. 
Okay. But even so, you're, you're sort of saying that if it is one day, it would this could be the impact. Right? Yeah, this would be the impact. I, I think we should explain, explain that. Columbia, yeah. The last time you presented, you spoke about on your site, you would manufacture since it's considered sustainable to get material within a 500 radius right. of the site. So in his last presentation, he did talk about manufacturing the material, growing the material, is, is getting the getting to build the material itself on the site. And that would also be a learning process, if I remember yeah. on his last presentation. Yeah, I said that it would be interesting if they could build on site. So such that instead of having to travel so right now they have to get it from the United Kingdom to get the material, and that's a lot of maybe that's a lot of travel costs. So it would be better. Can you know, get it in Mexico? Uh, you know, right now, from what I have, my research has shown that there's there's one big company called M Technology that's acquired the product. The product, okay, I'm thinking of the raw material. <laughs> <laughs> I think the notion that, that, that you're remembering is pretty much gone away. You're not going to grow this on your site. You may grow some, but it's a demonstration thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and so the, the piece of it that you're remembering, I don't think, is really embedded in your thesis anymore. No, I don't know. Because you can't grow it in the United States. So but one of the one of the proposals was to grow it and then use that material that was grown on site to develop a brick model. But a brick is a kind of hemp box. Mm -hmm. But uh, because it's illegal, you have to ship it. I guess my other observation is when you talk about poetics, um, for me, poetics are not rigid, not, I mean, you've got a material that's organic, but your poetic models are not organic at all. So I would think that maybe, maybe some of the others that you do could be, could reflect reflect more the nature of the fact that it is an organic product. Do you have an explanation for that? Um, do you want to respond? Do you want to do that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, I, uh, I think I might need some backup, but uh, I think that uh, the, the, the fiber in the herd is seed, the, the, the representative is different attributes to it. Right. So, for example, um, there's a, the herd could be pretty strong, so I just decided to create a, a, a strong-looking Right. There's no, there's a, some I use references, but others I just created and developed a strong model. So he's doing the attributes. I'm not doing the characteristics, not the material. Not the material right. So they will all be about the attributes. Yes. Do they all have to be about the attributes? Party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Party. <laughs> I mean, you seems like you're limiting yourself to something that I guess you think, you know, we think rectilinear, we already think architecture. But I just think you could go on a, out on the limb a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Maybe organic is one of the things that you add to it, and that gives you permission to explore yeah. more free form. All right. Okay. So. And what about the molecular level? I don't know since you're kind of delving into the fibers, you can you do some that are uh, deeper in. I, I, I thought about that. I saw the chemical composition of uh, 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 but I, I didn't want to copy it. That's a good. It's a good suggestion, though, because you're trying to harvest as much form implication as you can in the material. And so the molecular thing is just the pure organic thing. I think those are. I think those are rich possibilities. And I, I think that you just said the molecular structure. That's a diagram. Right. I mean the actual. Are there images of what the molecular structure is? Oh, I follow, I follow, I follow. Are there a 
this information. Electronic photographs. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The gnarly, right. hidden stuff. Right. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I think that helps. I think another piece, which you may be touching, but I don't remember. You don't have to go into depth about it, but for each of the uh, present material slash technical uses of hemp, like um, insulation and so forth, I would say a few things about how that's made. What what are the manufacturing uh, requirements? Because chances are not all of these forms of hemp are going to be made in the same factory. You're going to have different industrial demands. And chances are some of them are more easily made than others and make more sense as uh, uses of hemp, while others are maybe more expensive or difficult or because of what you have to do to the material. They're just not as competitive mm -hmm. as maybe other uses of hemp. Um, that, that, and not, not a big long-winded thing, but I think it's something that if you touch on it, you, you've done a more thorough treatment of the material. Um, getting back to the conceptual models, mm -hmm. um, the actual structure of the hemp plant, I think it has to do with, with fractals and parametric modeling. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's another richer, rich thing to look at. You know, how the it, you know, how it branches branches off, and it has a it has a way of diminishing in scale. That's um, it has an, an algorithmic um, sequence to it. One of the reasons why. Go ahead. You got something to say? Oh no, I was just going to ask. Are you leading up to the Mardi Gras sale? The Mardi Gras there. It's like um, they have that. They have that. Uh, it's like a picture of a fractal, and it's like all these funky, almost neon type colors, and you'll see this black void, but these circles like kind of like repeat themselves, and then they like zoom in, um, to like one of them, and then you see that the figure you had before kind of repeats itself again, and then you can zoom in to a little piece of it, and then. Itself again, yeah. itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, they have a lot of success. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, the punchline there that I've heard scientists say is in their hunt for materiality and the sort of ultimate materiality by looking at pieces of pieces of pieces of pieces never leads to materiality, it only leads to structure. And then you look at pieces of the structure, and it's not material, it's more structure. Yeah. So there's no such thing as material. There's only structure. And what appears as the pieces in the structure are just more structure. So what you never get to the end of is the ultimate structure. That's really pretty good. There's no such thing as material. It has to do with the fact that you know, you know Einstein and you know, Berkeley and all, and all of his things, and the two things never really touch mm -hmm. in reality. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, let me add something, because you're, you're being interested in this form thing, uh, or as poetics, it, it appeared, it, it was clear to us early on that if you just let the technical possibilities of hemp generate a scheme, there would be no holistic overarching form tendency. It would just be stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's using this poetics thing to give him some inspiration. Yeah. That the technical thing will eventually be worked into, yeah. but you know, insulation is not going to tell you how to organize your site, no. or how to organize the building, or what its yeah. overall form comportment is. And so yeah. that's what we're hoping is going to happen in this top, this top half. <clears throat> Um, okay, 10 after. Thank you, too. We're wrapped up. And uh, we're going to meet Monday. I don't think we'll meet Wednesday, but we will meet Monday. Night.